Hello, hello, Bluegrass Unlimited bass players. Uh, welcome to this uh, brief lesson video. Uh, I'm so happy to be on here sharing what I do and um, yeah, hope to uh, you know connect with y'all after this video in a lot of different ways. Um, just wanna let you know that I'll be working out of this book here. Um, I just published this with Mel Bay. Um, it's called Dirt Simple Upright Bass. We're gonna be looking at some of the techniques in here today. And um, I also have a Patreon page, which offers a lot of low cost video instruction. That's patreon.com slash Nate Sabat. You can pick up a copy of this book at my store on my website. That's natesabat.com. Uh, check me out on YouTube. Nate Sabat Bass is the name of my um, account. You can subscribe and I have some free content on there. Um, and also uh, connect with me directly via my website if you want to take a lesson or two. Uh, you know, online, or if you're in the New York area, you can even come here and uh, join me in this beautiful home office of mine. So, um, yeah, I just wanted to break down some of the concepts that I use to teach the upright bass. Um, I love bluegrass music, love acoustic music, and uh, went to school at Berklee College of Music um, and took some stuff that jazz players taught me, some stuff that classical players taught me, and you know, funneled it through folk music to create a technique and an approach that's uh, unique to me. So first things first, um, I'm going to put the book down and um, I just want to talk about the end pin. And for those of you who don't know that term, that's the stick at the bottom of the instrument that um, comes out and allows you to raise the height. So I typically put my end pin to a place where the nut of the bass, which is up here where the string uh, meets the tuning pegs up there, um, I like to keep that around one to two inches above my eye level. So as you can see, it's a little higher. And I'm a tall guy, so I have the end pin really far out. Other people may not need the end pin at all. Um, I assume most of you will need uh, something in between, you know? But yeah, just make sure that the bass is uh, not too far down to the ground. Uh, you want to make sure that, yeah, about one to two inches above eye level uh, is great for the nut. Once you have that, uh, I want you to try this fun little exercise. And this is all about balance. You don't want to put any weight of the instrument on your arms or your hands. So what you're going to do is, using the side of the bass, rest it on your stomach, really just coming right at your stomach, and let your arms float free in midair. You know, and the bass might move. Obviously, don't let the bass fall to the ground or anything, unless you want to get a new one. Um, but try to try to make it rest on your stomach. There we go. A little bit, at least. And the idea is that the weight of the instrument is coming into your body. So your core is supporting the instrument. Your hands and your arms are free to do what they need to do to play it. Um, this is a really important part of technique. You know, the bass is an Olympic sport of an instrument to play. And if you do it wrong, uh, there are, you know, going to be some consequences, unfortunately. So try to uh, alleviate as many of those as possible. So we're resting it on the stomach. Our hands are out. Another thing is we can use our left knee to support the instrument on the back. It's another way to keep it balanced. That might help if it keeps falling over. So yeah, that helps for me at least today. So put the left knee on the back of the instrument. And then we're gonna talk about our right hand and our right arm. So there's this concept called arm weight. And arm weight is essentially utilizing gravity to help create a big sound on the instrument. The sensation you're gonna want is something like this. You put your arm out, kind of like you're a zombie, um, and you just drop your arm down to your side, but don't force it. Just gonna let it fall. Gravity does the work for you. You don't need to force it. And that's that feeling of arm weight. When you come through the string, you wanna have that sensation. Obviously you're not gonna, you're not gonna let your arm fall completely to your side. You just wanna keep it rested on the string and let it fall back to the next string. Big sound, but I'm not doing a lot. I'm just really letting that that sensation of arm weight carry me through. Um, and 
Once your right hand plays a note, that was the D string, um, you'll notice that your thumb um, needs to go somewhere when, you, when you're when you playing the note on the bass. I like hooking my thumb on the back of the fingerboard, um, just enough so I have some tension, you know? Um, it kind of acts as an anchor for the hand. So wrap your thumb around the fingerboard just a little bit, um, not too much, and then you're gonna be playing the notes in kind of a diagonal way, or a, you know, a more of a parallel way to this string. It's not gonna be so much like this. If some of you play electric bass, uh, it's not really the same hand position when we're playing upright. You want it a bit more tilted. So that being said, you have all that in mind. You can play through. And just let the arm do the work. The finger is just the controller. The arm is what, you know, uh, creates the momentum. So we have our right hand now set up. We're going to look at the left hand. Um, and a really important thing with the left hand is you don't want to go into claw mode. You know, I've seen a lot of people do this and while I use it sometimes if I'm really tired in the middle of a gig, uh, I like to keep my hand stretched like this. And this is the best economy of motion. And when we're talking about the left hand, you want to be economical. So the exercise I have for you today uh, is three half steps in a row. And um, that keeps your hand nice and stretched and make sure you can uh, you know, hit all three of those notes without moving your hand too much. Keep in mind your thumb on the left hand is on the back side of the neck. It'll be right directly across from your second finger, that's your middle finger. So they are always across from one another no matter where your hand moves up and down the neck. So on the G string, you play the first note that's not the open string, that's a G sharp. Then the second note, which is an A, with your second finger. Third note is a B flat. So that's one, two, and four. We don't use our third finger independently in this part of the bass. It comes down with the pinky, with the fourth finger. So it's one, two, and four. And that's, that's a really important thing to remember. So we're going back down to A, back down to G sharp, up to B flat, to A, and back to B flat. It's called Neener Neener. Kind of sounds like a, an old seesaw or something uh, in the breeze. That keeps your hand nice and positioned, you know. Um, that's what you want your hand to look like, your left hand. Don't let it go into the claw. So with arm weight and economy of motion, uh, and we're balancing the base on our core, we're ready to start um, delving into some music, actually. Uh, first thing I want to demonstrate is the G major scale. That's the scale we're going to be using today with the song from my book, Going Down the Road Feeling Bad. Um, the G major scale is one of eight scales that I like to cover for bluegrass music. There's, you know, eight keys that we typically play in in bluegrass. G is maybe the most common, um, so it's the one I featured in the book. Uh, and again, we're using our first finger, pointer, second finger, middle, fourth finger, pinky, and our open strings as well. You know, sometimes you don't even need to play notes with fingers. Just let those open strings ring out. And that gives a really nice punchy sound uh, in a bluegrass band. So first thing, we're going to start on the E string. That's the G. And it's going to be with our second finger. Open A. First finger on B. Second finger on C. Open D. First finger on E, fourth finger F sharp, and then the open G. Coming back down, it sounds like this. So that's the scale we're gonna be using today in this bass line that I have worked out. We're not gonna be using every note in that scale, but that's the core of which we're working from. Um, Looking at building a groove 
in this key of G major. Uh, a really great tool is your metronome. I have one on my phone, so I can pull it up here. I like putting it at 60 beats per minute to start. And we're just gonna play a root fifth bass line. That's the standard bass line in bluegrass music. Sounds something like this. I'm just gonna use the open G and the open D. Three, four. As you can see, I'm muting the notes halfway through, almost as if there was a mandolin player playing with me, uh, giving some backbeat. And that's what creates a really bouncy, fun groove in bluegrass. With the open strings, I'm using my left hand to mute them. I'll let the metronome act as a mandolin and play along with it. Just putting my whole left hand down to mute that string. Feels a little bit like a band building a groove, you know? So that's a really great tool when you're trying to work out playing, um, you know, a groove or starting to play um, something on your own without a band. Metronome is a really important tool. When you're playing notes that aren't open strings, easiest way to mute them is to simply lift your finger. Uh, in this bass line, we're gonna be using the uh, C on the A string. Um, and that's actually our one note that isn't open um, for this bass line. So what you're gonna do is lift your second finger in this case. And you'll hear a little bit of sound when the notes are muted, but that doesn't necessarily translate to something that's being heard when there's a full band. It doesn't matter if there's a little bit of a noise, Maybe it's even helpful so you can hear to make sure you're muting in the right place. Again, it's right halfway in the middle of that note. That's what makes it feel like a really bouncy bluegrass groove. So that being said, we have our G major scale, we have our groove. Now it's time to apply it to the song. Um, I'll sing it and play it. Um, and you'll notice that in between every chord, I'm not using the fifth of the previous chord. I'm gonna repeat the root of the chord I'm coming from, landing me on the root of the chord I'm going to. Uh, it sounds something like this. I'll do it without singing to start. So I'm playing that root fifth pattern when I'm on a chord for an extended period of time, and then as a transition note, as something different, I'm repeating that root. So for instance, G, G going to C, instead of G, D going to C. This is a really important part of my book and my method. You want to use a note that, typically, you want to use a note that's different from the fifth uh, when you're going from chord to chord. It's a transition note. It makes it feel different. It builds tension that releases into the next chord. So I really like starting with repeated roots. And then from there, you can get more experimental. And I do that in this book. Uh, the baseline I'm showing you today is baseline version one of a song. And uh, from there, there's three different versions um, that I offer in the book uh, of multiple songs, baseline two, three, and four with variations and ways to, um, you know, add color to your bass line so it's not so in the box like this. But first you wanna get this down, make sure it's feeling comfortable. So this is what it sounds like with the vocal melody to finish it off. And uh, thanks so much for watching this video, y'all. I hope, hope we can uh, be in touch after this. And um, here's going down the road feeling bad. I'm going down the road feeling bad. Again, you can find me at natesabbat.com 
where you can pick up a copy of Dirt Simple Upright Bass on my store. Uh, Patreon for video lessons, patreon.com slash Nate Sabbath. Uh, hit me up on my website for lessons. Uh, subscribe to me on YouTube. And uh, I'll see you all out there. Have fun. <laughs>